in the description. Greetings, I'm Shad, and welcome to this very special episode of Shadiversity, where we are graced by the presence of the Metatron himself. And if you don't know who the Metatron is, I highly suggest you go check out his channel. In fact, he has just uploaded a video in conjunction with this one that is about the greatest samurai battle ever fought. And I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation, and Metatron likes accurate pronunciation, but because I'm gonna butcher it anyway, I'm just gonna go all the way with it. The Battle of the Sekigahara. But anyway, do go check out his video after you watch this one. There will be a link in the description and also a link at the end of the video. But let's get into the subject at hand, which, as evident by the title of this video, is a comparison between medieval European castles and medieval Japanese castles. Uh, both fall into the medieval period, but medieval is a term that's starting to be, you know, associated with Europe specifically. So, confusion, right? History, it's great. Hello Shad and everyone, Metatron here. Castles are fascinating. They're not just fortified structures. They are iconic symbols of power and military control. There are an awful lot of similarities between European castles and Japanese castles, and Japanese called Shiro, but there are also a few points of difference. Now on this video, Shad and I shall join forces to examine both. Beginning with the materials that these two different cultures used in building their castles and why they differed between them respectively. And then we'll be looking at those same questions, how they were done and why in regards to the walls, moats and general layout. And when you think of materials, walls, moats, layouts, you might think it's not too complex, but when you really start to look at it, well, it gets awesomely complex and really, really interesting. So we're gonna dive into it head first, starting with materials. A Japanese castle was a masterwork of wood and rock, a symbol of authority and ruling power. Now on this video we will mainly focus on the most classical and renowned type of Japanese castles, those that were built in the 16th and 17th century respectively. Azuchi Castle, Momoyama Castle, Himeji, Kumamoto, all of these very famous castles belonged either to the Sengoku era or the Edo era. However, before diving in, I would like to briefly mention earlier and more primitive examples of pre-Sengoku era castles. Understanding the differences between earlier Japanese castles and later Japanese castles will help us appreciate and comprehend certain stylistic choices and modifications which occurred over the years. So we said that the Japanese word for castle is shiro, which is written with this character here. Now, those castles instead that predate the Sengoku Jidai kind of castles that we have in mind, so the earlier Japanese castles, are called Yamajiro. Now, check this out. Look how it's written. I think it's already interesting. It gives you a hint to the meaning. So this is the character for Yama, and this is the character we pronounce Jiro. Okay? So you can already see that the character to write uh, Jiro, in this case, is the same character with which we write the word Shiro, which we said it means fort or fortification. So it's just a vocalized version. The sh becomes j. This is a typical phenomenon that happens linguistically when you have two kanjis, one next to each other, but the word is the same. It means castle. And yama in Japanese means mountain. And you can actually see that it sort of looks a little bit like a, uh, a mountain, very stylized. So, mountain castles are the one that precede the sort of early Japanese castles. Now, this information, this name might be misleading because the way you look at this, you might think, well, later castles were not built on mountains, whereas earlier castles were built on mountain. But mm, no, that's not exactly how it is. That's not how we should interpret this. You see, also some later castles were built on top of mountains. And even when eventually they will stop building castles on mountains, they will start building castle, castles on plains, the idea of understanding the importance of super, tactical superiority of having a castle on a higher, on the higher ground, they will build them on, on small hills. And if the terrain was too flat, they would actually create artificial mounds to put the foundations of the castles on top. So the reason why earlier castles are called Yamajiro, it's because they were not just built on the mountains, but they were built from the mountains. The stone and dirt of the mountains itself was carved into rough fortifications, digging ditches and creating natural walls. And the further back in time you go, the more naturalistic these fortresses will be, being made of rammed earth and wood. 
Although 16th century castles made a lot more use of stone for their buildings than previous castles, still the main material was timber. Now initially, castle buildings were made of wattle and daub and they were covered with thatched roofing. But thatch catches fire even more easily than wood does, and therefore eventually they would be completely replaced by stone and wood. On the matter of the wooden component of Japanese castles, I'd like to clarify now the reason why wood was still chosen as the main component of Japanese castles, even when talking about later castles, and also why a Japanese castle will never become a stone-only structure. The first thing that comes to mind when considering a wooden structure is how easy it would be for such structure to be set on fire, which seems to be a contradiction considering that the main function of a castle is to protect and defend an area of military and political relevance. But the answer, the explanation, comes with the way the Japanese treated the wood used to build such structures. These wooden structures were surprisingly fireproof as a result of the plaster used on the walls, which was a mixture of lime, seaweed and other natural ingredients. Sometimes as much as six coats would be applied. Other times the wooden walls would be completely lacquered, like in the case of Matsumoto Castle, with its iconic black walls and surrounded by mountains, planks over plaster and lacquered for water resistance. So what we have here is functionality in beauty. Similarly to what happens with the samurai armor, in a way, where we see iron and steel plates lacquered for rust resistance. Although I'd like to underline that the Japanese have been lacquering their armor far beyond the samurai scope of existence. It's something that was done a lot earlier. We're talking about pre-samurai era. So, in a way, the idea of lacquering armor was they were doing it in order to make samurai armor highly functional, durable because of water resistance, rust resistant, and at the same time beautiful. One of the key differences that you might have noticed when comparing Japanese to European castles is the fact that there's an assumption that all European castles were built out of stone. Well, first of all, let me clear up that. No, there were many castles that were made out of wood, not just in the early medieval period, but in the high medieval period and even after it. It simply came down to the availability of resources. Though, having said that, even when wooden castles were more common, like after the Norman Conquest in Britain, yeah, there were a lot of wooden castles, but they still actually had the technology, or they could find people who knew how to build large stone structures. Several hundred years before the Norman Conquest, you had Charlemagne building his large palace, a large structure built out of stone. And this was again founded on the technological legacy that was still in existence thanks to Rome. In fact, it wasn't long after the Norman Conquest that we see some of the first stone keeps being built. The conditions in which you would want to build a wooden castle comes back to that thing I mentioned, availability of resources. And if the Lord wasn't rich enough to build something out of stone, well, he could build something that was perfectly fit for purpose out of wood. And more often than not, these castles were slowly upgraded bit by bit into stone. There are also elements in stone construction that can be quite fiddly and difficult to do, which also increases the cost. Building just a straight stone wall, there are some complex elements to that construction, but when understood, they can do it without too much difficulty. But when you get up to the top where you want to be able to fire down at enemies and have an extended platform, to avoid that complexity, the upper battlements on castles could often be made out of wood. Sometimes they were temporary, sometimes they were permanently affixed, and these wooden types of extended battlements at the top of stone walls and towers are called hoardings. What is particularly interesting regarding European castles when compared to Japan is the fact that they wouldn't have really worked out quite well if you were to build a European style, you know, large stone castle in Japan for a very significant reason. Earthquakes. Tall, stiff stone structures don't fare very well against earthquakes. And earthquakes are a lot more common in Japan than in Europe. So instead, they needed to engineer a methodology of construction that would serve their purposes effectively. And what's really interesting about this is that Japan's woodworking technology, because their castles, or sorry, the battlements and keeps are made out of wood, is incredibly sophisticated. And in my mind, their woodworking technology outpaces Europe because they needed to build these structures out of wood. And in contrast, European stoneworking technology outpaced Japan because they could get away with actually having these stone buildings. And it is amazing to note how effectively these wooden stone keeps are able to withstand earthquakes. They're built in this almost interlocking way that can absorb massive levels of vibration and it's really impressive stuff. Technical question. How were the walls of Japanese castles actually made? 
When you build a castle, architectural elegance definitely plays an important part in the construction of all the buildings involved. Castles are also a way to show off your wealth, power and influence as a warlord and this happened particularly in the Sengoku Jidai when castles became the actual residence of the daimyo, the feudal lords. However, at the end of the day a castle was still primarily a military installation. So even if we can all agree that they were definitely built with a political agenda in mind, perhaps some form of even propaganda, at the end of the day they were still primarily military buildings and the primary objective of a castle was to repel enemy attacks, to repel enemy waves. Simply put, this was achieved in the following manner. You had the residence of the Lord and everything that was built around it had the sole purpose of making sure that no one could reach the heart of the complex. This was achieved in several ways. The layout of the castle, for instance, was rather significant, but we'll get to that later. The most fundamental form of structural obstacle used to repel enemy waves were the walls. Just like with any other culture, the first kind of fortified protections in Japan were wooden stockades. But as we move to stone walls, things start to become rather peculiar. Built from the bottom up by stacking stones roughly cut into shape, the walls of a Japanese castle are, to me, one of the most intriguing parts of the whole complex. Walls don't have rectangular blocks, each single stone is carefully considered in its shape and placement, one by one, and although when looked upon they might give the appearance of being placed randomly, if you look closely, you will see a constant trend of straight horizontal lines as a result of careful placement. No mortar is used to fix the stones in place. Only the pressure applied by the following layers will ensure structural integrity, which shows a tremendous understanding of all the different forces at play. The curves were calculated very carefully, alternating end and size of oblong stones, as apparently switching the orientation makes the wall stronger. Building with natural irregular stones helped the durability of the walls, as the very regularity of the stones helps dissipating the pressure applied to the wall. This support allowed larger, heavier and more permanent buildings. In 2004, strength tests were conducted during the construction of an expressway in Japan. The results of these tests showed that the concrete block walls cracked under 200 tons of pressure, whereas a stone wall made the traditional 400 years old way was able to resist up to 250. Also, the sloping walls gave a certain level of defense against the frequent Japanese earthquakes. Similarly to European walls, Japanese castle walls had slits in them which were used to fire at attackers, maintaining almost full cover. These are called sama in Japanese, when speaking in general terms. Arrow slits were called yasama. Gun emplacements were called teppo-sama, while later cannon spaces were called taiho-sama. Differently from European castles, Japanese castles did not have walkways built into the walls. Planks would be placed simply over the walls to allow archers and gunners to take position. The first thing that I should point out in regards to castle walls in medieval Europe is that a castle didn't need a wall around it for it to be a castle. The primary part of a castle is the part that people actually live in, and that is more often than not called the keep, though there are exceptions because the keep can often refer to something large and fortified, and if it's not got several, you know, levels to it, meaning a tower, because keep originally meant tower, but then it kind of changes, just meaning the place that people live in, that it can get a little complex. But anyway, the main level portion, usually called the keep in a castle. You see, the keep is kind of important in regards to what a castle is, because, like I said, that's the part that people actually live in, but what is a castle? Well, see, a castle is a fortified private residence. There are exceptions to it being a person's residence, but that's the primary and most standard defining feature. It's someone's home. So, take away the home part of a castle, you don't have a castle, you just have a set of walls. But take away the walls from the home part. If the home part is still fortified and it's someone is living in it, it is still a castle. So that's the first thing about walls. Not essential for medieval castles, but very, very useful. And whenever they were put on castles, there are some significant kind of differences between medieval European castles and Japanese castles. And one of the things you'll notice is Japanese castle walls tend to serve as a kind of retaining wall to a raised earthwork behind it. There's a very distinct advantage to this type of design, and in fact it wasn't only just done in Japan, it was also done in Europe as well. A good example of this, even though the castle is in Syria, not Europe, it was built by Europeans, so clearly it shows that they understood this, but it's the castle, the Crack de Chevalier, in Syria. The first and most outer wall is serving as a retaining wall to a raised portion of earth behind it. So, 
advantages. The main advantage of this type of wall is you can't really knock it down and then go through the hole that you make because if you knock down the stone you have a big wall of dirt behind it. It's not going to serve you any purpose to bombard this most outer wall you just have to get around it or over it somehow. So that's the big advantage with that type of wall. There is a disadvantage with it as well and I think this explains the reason why for most of European castles, their walls were freestanding and they weren't dedicated retaining walls. And the reason is, by having freestanding walls surrounding the more important part, the livable portion, remember, the, people, the place people are living in, is it can serve as a shield or barrier against bombardment. In fact, when it comes to the positioning of the buildings within the bailey of a medieval castle, you will notice that they hug the external wall. By placing these buildings right next to the external walls, they are actually getting complete cover from external bombardment. This would be impossible if the ground level of the internal bailey was too close in elevation to the upper part or ramparts of the external walls. If you don't need to worry about bombardment, you can focus your design on dealing with troop attacks. And you can do these really large complex layouts that'll confuse people, send them around in circles and all these things. But if you're dealing with bombardment and the fact that people can just knock down walls and attack from a location you can't really account for, well, your design, your mentality, it starts to shift. The next difference between European and Japanese castle walls is quite a significant one, and it's the fact that Japanese castle walls didn't generally have ramparts built atop of them, but this is very much due to that interesting style that I pointed out. The ground floor behind a Japanese castle wall is generally at a comparable elevation to where the rampart would be on a European castle wall. Therefore, instead of putting battlements and ramparts atop the wall itself, as the Metatron has just pointed out, Japanese castle walls had types of arrow slits and gun slits, and these were placed at the ground level behind the wall, which actually puts them up much higher on the part of the wall facing the outside. Yet at times, there was still a need for samurai to be atop these walls during a castle siege, and in those circumstances, you really really can see the tactical advantage of having an inbuilt rampart and fortification, specifically crenellations, atop these walls. And indeed, crenellations are one of the most iconically recognisable features of a medieval castle. The tooth part of the crenellations, called the merlon, gives full cover for any soldier standing behind it, and the gap in between, the crenel, offers provision for soldiers to shoot in between. Now, the concept of moats have been around for a very long time, even before castles were around. If you look at uh, the hill forts and ring forts and stuff, it was very common for uh, ditches to be dug around them. And, of course, it was very common for the Romans to dig a ditch around their fortifications. It's very easy to follow the logic and find the defences of advantages in this, so we shouldn't be surprised that moats were common in other parts of the world, especially in Japan. But Metatron will speak more about that in a second. In regards to European moats, they could be wide, they could be small, they could have water in them or they could be completely empty and there are also instances of them being empty but with wooden pikes being stuck at the bottom so if anyone fell into the moat they would find a very pointy introduction. There is an issue with creating a moat all around a castle or really any type of fortification and that's getting access to the fortification. What about the primary gate? Uh, and because of this, there are many instances where there was a bridge. Either the earth was raised right in front of the gate to enable a natural connection between one side of the land to the other, but it also created a weakness because that meant, ah, the bad guys, they can now reach the wall or indeed the gatehouse without having to deal with the moat. So the way to solve this problem, to take away the ability for the bad guys to reach your walls or where the primary entrance is, but to still enable yourself and the people, you know, your soldiers to defend it, to get access in and out of the castle, is to create an extendable but also retractable bridge over this ditch you've dug in between your fortifications and the nearby land. And of course, I'm talking about the drawbridge. Any fortification that doesn't have a drawbridge has to deal with their big weakness that they have this bridge right here for the enemy to go across and reach the walls without any issue apart from dealing with arrow fire from the defenders atop the wall. But if you take that away from them, well then they have all the problems and issues associated with getting past this big moat in front of them. In order to aid the defense of the structure, moats were built around some castles by diverting mountain streams. So what is the Japanese word for moat? Well, there are quite a few, but to begin with, one possible way to say moat is mizuki. 
which literally means water fort. But there are also other ways to say moat, and we'll get to that later. But one important thing to say is that there is a difference between moats in, of castles in modern times and moats of castles in feudal times. In feudal times, these moats would only be filled with water in times of conflict. So moats were very common and some were very elaborate and sometimes you had many moats laid out in concentric circles around the castles and a host of different pattern engineered around the landscape. There are also some examples of castles such as Himeji where we see the construction of a secondary inner moat which was constructed between the more central area residences and the outer section where lower ranking samurai kept their residences. Only a very few commoners, those directly in the employ and service of the daimyo or his retainers, lived within the walls and they were often designated portions of the compound to live in according to their occupation for purposes of administrative efficiency. The outer moat of a Japanese castle typically had a very specific purpose, it being to protect other support buildings in addition to the castle. Apart from providing protection, some most normally also provided a vital waterway to the city. So as I was saying, there were also a few different types of moats. Tatebori, vertical moat, a dry moat dug into a slope. Unejo tatebori, furrowed shape empty moat a series of parallel trenches running up the sides of the excavated mountain, and the doi, earthen wall, literally earth mound, made of earth dug out from a moat. The political condition of Japan in the Sengoku Jidai is what ignited the proliferation of castles in the land of the rising sun. We have a weak central authority, and as a result, new samurai warlords start sprouting all over the place, ready to do battle with their rival clans. This instability and fragmentation will give ground to one of the most prolific periods as far as castle building is concerned. We are talking in the thousands. As we said before, the layout was crucial during the building of a Japanese castle. First and foremost, a shiro was built on a certain area to protect and control that area, whether it be a port, a river or an important crossroads. But what's essential to consider is the fact that almost invariably, Japanese castles and fortresses incorporated the landscape in their defences. Japanese castles had several sections called baileys in English or maru in Japanese within them, delineated by country yards. At the centre of the castle you have the main keep called tenshukaku. This keep, which overlooks the whole complex, is contained inside the central maru, or section, which is called hommaru. Layer after layer, many more maru separate the rest of the castle, creating a multi-layered defence. The shape of these maru is dictated by both the topography of the land, thus some could be higher, others could be lower, and by the specific style chosen by the architect, which could be concentric or in rows. In the heart of the castle, he had three kinds of essential structures, the residence of the lord, the kura, or storerooms, and the living quarters of the garrison. The inner system of gates and walls within these sections of the castles were an ingenious defensive strategy. Since sieges rarely involved the wholesale destruction of walls, castle designers and defenders could anticipate the way in which an invading army would move through the compound, from one gate to another, gaining a certain level of tactical advantage over their enemies and allowing the garrison to be deployed promptly and efficiently. The intricate defence layout of Himeji Castle is a perfect example of this. Looking at Kumamoto layout, we can see that it is designed to eliminate any direct approach to the main keep. You have a third keep or tower, which is considered the fulcrum of its defences, used to spot the enemies from afar, and once they reach the compound, they will be entirely surrounded by these stone walls, watchtowers and parapets on top of the walls. As the sole just start to go through the complex they will get fired upon constantly. The local garrison will perform a head-on assault while Ashigaru and samurai on the walls will shoot from the side and from behind. The whole castle is designed as to make sure the enemy will always be in the line of fire as long as he is within the structure. This shows that the Japanese castles had an emphasis on the concept called in military tactics flanking fire. One of the most important elements of castle design is this concept of redundancies, fallback positions, or as I like to call them, layers of defence. And it's interesting to notice that both Europe and Japan understood this principle and employed them in the design of their castles. Some beautiful examples of excessive segmented castle layout in Europe are the five baileys of Korf Castle, the 14 gatehouses of Hochostovitz Castle, and the many segments of Regersburg Castle. And indeed, have a look at this artistic recreation of Regersburg in kind of its heyday. Have a look at all the individual baileys, gatehouses, and towers that are spotted all over this design and layout. The principle here is to make it so that there's only one feasible direction to assault the castle and then fortify that approach as much as possible. You want to force the enemy to run through a pathway of death. The issue is that it's not always possible to funnel the enemy in this way. Uh, now, it's usually achieved by placing the castle on a really 
large hill or digging a massive moat around it. But moats can be filled in and perfectly positioned large hills are not always where you want them to be. In fact, having a hugely fortified single approach to a castle was actually more the exception than the norm. More often than not, castles didn't have this luxury. And because of that, they needed to fortify every single face of the outer walls and the castle from which an enemy might be able to approach it. And in this case, having a very large segmented design in the castle's layout could actually be quite detrimental detrimental. For one, really large castles can only be effectively defended by a larger garrison, and having a larger garrison requires more resources just to feed them. And not being able to maintain this upkeep can become the death blow for a castle when you look at them in the light of drawn out sieges. Sometimes sieges can last over a year's time. More mouths to feed equals a very big problem. Also, castles that have a really big layout can be attacked from multiple directions, and this creates a problem with the defenders, because the defenders fighting off attackers from one side can't help defend their castle from the other side. It's too big. But castles with a smaller layout can actually utilize their defenders to a more efficient level. With the castle being smaller, it actually takes less time for the defenders to reach the other part of the wall that comes under assault. Also, soldiers defending their keep are still able to fire down at enemies assaulting the outer walls. This effectively utilizes the soldiers as if they were on the outer walls when they're not. They're actually still up at the keep. Which means they're still perfectly situated in the right fallback position if the outer walls are breached. And in fact, if the castle is attacked from another direction, they are also also perfectly situated to defend that side of the castle if no one is there yet. You see, this mentality, this understanding of enhancing the effectiveness of the amount of soldiers you have was understood and employed even more. It's the very principle behind a common type of European castle design called the concentric castle. The principle or concept behind a concentric castle is basically a castle within a castle, and the soldiers manning the second line of defense can actually still fire on enemies assaulting the first line of defense. Indeed, the concentric castle is designed to maximize the fortifications available to the defenders while at the same time minimalizing the overall design and layout as much as possible. So with this concept understood, there they're essentially trying to enhance the defensive value of each individual soldier. They are trying to gain more for less. Ten soldiers in a smaller castle can actually be as functionally effective, if not more so, and repel attacks coming from multiple directions than 30 soldiers in a very large castle. So in this sense, size does matter because there is such a thing as too big, and that statement can be taken way out of context. But that is actually it. And with that subject covered, we are now at the end of this epic collection. Actually, Shadow, there is one last thing you need to know about Japanese castles. Oh, okay, uh, what's that? One of the coolest things about castles, one of the things you love the most. <laughs> I think I might know what you're talking about. You, know, you don't mean... Yes, yes I do. Just say it with me. Matriculations! I've actually found these pictures, these screenshots of Japanese matriculations. I think they're quite cool. As you can see, they're mostly wooden structures. They are part of the walls and they are used to throw stones, rocks at your enemy who are too close to be shot with actual arrows and other sort of weapons. What I like about Japanese matriculations is that they are fully integrated within the geometry of the castle, within the facade of the wall. If you don't pay close attention, you might not even notice that they are there. And here is an inside shot of what you would see if you were inside the castle and you were using matriculations. That is awesome. And if you'd like additional information on European machiculations, I have a whole dedicated video on that subject, which also explores the general practice in medieval architecture of having overhangings on the upper floors. I'll put a link to it at the end of this video, which brings us to the end of this awesome collaboration. Thank you very much, Metatron. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you join us in this video and sharing of your expertise. And to let my own viewers know, if you guys want to learn more about medieval Roman and Japanese arms and armor, history and warfare, you really have to go check out the Metatron's YouTube channel. One of the best, and like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, he has just released a video on the greatest samurai battle of history, Sekigahara. Sorry. Please do go check it out. It is going to be brilliant. I hope to see you again, and until that time, farewell.